Hello and welcome to Ear Read This. Today we're trying something a little bit different and we're talking about a relatively modern book. We're talking about The Driver's Seat by Muriel Spark. I'm Adam. And I'm Ash. How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. A lot better after reading this book. Yeah. This is the second time I've read it and I loved it the first time through and I think I still love it the second time through. Well, I read it uh, for the second time as well. And um, I actually didn't really like it the first time around. And but have I, you come around on it this time? Yeah, I like it a lot more. Oh. I'm really glad we're doing this because, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, we, we should probably start out with saying, uh, spoiler alert. Yes, this book is very short, like 100 pages. Yeah. And it has, you know, a great plot progression to an unexpected ending. And I wouldn't want to ruin it for anybody who hasn't experienced it. No. Before. Yeah, uh, but it's also impossible to talk about it uh, critically without going into... So we are going to spoil every aspect of the plot of this book. Every single one. Every single one. (laughs) Aggressively. With great violence. (laughs) Um, Which is inherent in this book. Yeah, so if you um, would like to read it with fresh eyes, turn off right now and go and get yourself a copy of Muriel Sparks' The Driver's Seat. If you're still here... Let's jump into it right right away. So it's a it's a it's a why done it. It's not a who done it. It's a why done it. And I think that term was coined by either Muriel Spark or a reviewer of hers for well, this book. Well, it does crop up in the book, doesn't it? It does. Uh, yeah. Very casual throwaway line. Someone says, "Oh, this book is a why done." I think Lise, the main character, yes, our um, our focus for tonight. Uh, and the reason she talks about why done it is she she's in one. She's in one. I, she... like, I felt like Captain Barbosa for a <laughs> Well, so hopefully everybody who's still listening has read this book, but as you hopefully should all know... Or doesn't give a shit. Or doesn't give a shit. You're welcome as well. The main character is setting out to leave her life in wherever she's from, we'll get to that, behind, to be murdered. She's a murderee. A murderee. A willing murderee. Orchestrating her own murder from the off. From the off in the style and aesthetic that she desires yeah so um reading this a second time and to be honest reading this the first time because i did know the ending before i read it um you know that this character is is heading in in one direction one direction only and the second time through you start to pick up some of the subtler hints yeah it's hinted throughout the book and as the book goes on the hints become less and less subtle but i think to start at the beginning when she's shopping for clothes And the first line of the book, roughly, is the shop attendant asking or saying this dress is made out of a new non-staining material to which Lee's laughs manically. You've just ruined my dramatic reading. (laughs) Do you 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 want to do a dramatic reading on the heels of that then? Well, no, I will. I will still do my dramatic reading. (laughs) But shall we start with a little bit of... Background on Muriel herself. A little bit of... uh, Well, yeah. Um, Born in Brunsfield, in Edinburgh. I thought you were going to say, yeah, I thought that would be fucking impressive. No, she was um, local Edinburgh. Oh, I didn't know it was Brunsfield. Brunsfield, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we've made this point before, but we are an Edinburgh podcast. We are an Edinburgh-based podcast. Uh, The world's only UNESCO city of literature. (laughs) <laughs> I thought you were about to say the only UNESCO sponsored podcast. <laughs> UNESCO approved this week. <laughs> and this week only. And this week only. Yeah. But no, she's um not one of I think one of Edinburgh's favoured children of literature. Top scribes. Top scribes. Great back catalogue. Yeah. Of which I've read a shameful few, but the ones I've read I've enjoyed. Me too. I've read uh Brody yes. and um Memento Mori. And I've read, I've read Brody, I've read Abbess of Crew, yep. Driver's Seat, yep. and The Comforters, ah. and that's it. So, the thing I noticed about her is that she, 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 she's not an author that you can really ever feel uh, at home with. She's not someone you can no. pick open and go, ah, classic, classic beginning for a insert author name here. No, so, totally. It's, um, she, does, she doesn't have a consistent voice. It seemed like... She does or she doesn't? She doesn't. Doesn't, no. I don't think so. The, well, the driver's seat is sort of almost surrealist. Yeah. In its construction and its theme, where it's more experimental than some of her other books. Like, I think the reason that Prime of Miss Jean Brodie was so successful is because it's her most 
standard literary work in terms of its structure. But do you think, having read The Driver's Seat, that there's probably a bit, maybe a bit more going on in Miss Jean Brady that... Oh, yes. Well, I've, the eye? I've not read it for years and years, since I was at school, really. Yeah. So I read it with very naive eyes before. I feel like if I was to read it again, I would pick up on a lot more. And I think I want to now after reading Driver's Seat again. And they've recently come out with a really beautiful hardback collection of all of her books, mm. numbered and sort of typewriter letters on the spine that spell out a, a, a mystery word that you can only find out if you own all of the books. Oh, really? What's yeah. the word? I know, but I've forgotten it. Because <laughs> <laughs> when, I was at, when I was at the festival, I lined them all up. Oh, okay. How do they, how do they spell, um, spell them out? Is it so on, on, on the spine, there's one letter per spine. Oh, okay. I genuinely can't remember what it spells, but if that intrigues you, go out and buy the <laughs> entire collection. If you're a sucker for uh, marketing campaigns <laughs> like that, to be fair though, the covers are really pretty. If they were to if they were to be additions to those really books, nice. I don't that I don't those ones. Kind of tactic does remind me of sort of cereal box toys. Well, speaking of the covers, judging books by their covers, yeah, the the cover of this one that you were reading is different from the one I was reading. Yeah, you said. So mine has... Yours has. I'm looking at it right now. It has... Uh, it's similar to the one I am I own in the sense that the pattern of her dress was very important to her. If I say silver penguin, everyone will know Silver that. penguin, and I was reading the the green penguins, the Nile penguins. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And the patterning of her dress is important to her. She goes yeah. to all these shops and picks out this particular dress, and the dress is a common the theme. lurid possible. Lurid possible. And on this cover, she's got the dress. She's also holding a British passport. On mm. mine, it's just the dress. And I think this is a really good place to start because the origin point of the character is ambiguous and so is her destination. Yeah. She is coming from an unknown but hinted country and going to another unknown but hinted country. And, I mean, I don't know. Maybe if I'd read it four times, I wouldn't think it was subtly hinted but as far as i can tell on read two uh -huh. they're fairly loose they're fairly it, it, sparse hints it's more about areas of the world i think on the second i i did some research on this myself because i was curious and the consensus seems to be that she's coming from somewhere scandinavian mm. and going to somewhere mediterranean yeah i think what i know i mean it's not really what i was focusing on second time around i got drawn no. into different sort of areas for of me i ended up doing i ended up doing detail work i liked yeah i was exploring weird bits of the plot yeah stuff that in other books would be obvious but in this is obscured for some reason what jumped out second time around though was the references to i come from the north <laughs> you are someone from the south Yes. Um, or the uh, customs guy saying, uh, there's a great quote, which I'm going to get to because it's, it's a good point. Um, your, your other stuff uh, hasn't arrived yet in our country. Yes. You know, it, there's, there's quite a lot of people stepping around naming anything too well, particular. Yeah. Well, whatever the point is. Well, other there, places are mentioned. The other places are and mentioned. And perhaps the correct ones are. But it's, I think, interesting in the sense that no matter what, where she's from or where she's going the point is she's going from somewhere to somewhere that's far removed from where she's come from yeah. and i think she is putting herself outside of her comfort zone on purpose mm, yeah because i think her her end result from this she wants to either be as glamorous or exotic as possible or so far removed from her old life that it's unrecognizable yeah and yeah exactly yeah being an alien environment exactly I think that keeps cropping up a lot do you want to, sorry to put this on you, and you can fire it back to me if you like, but do you want to do a real quick run through the actual plot? Because there, there isn't much. Let's do it. Let's do it in steps. I'll do one, then you do one. Okay, you do the so, first step. I'll start. So she was starting off in a, a Scandinavian country, we assume, based on some hints throughout the novel about things that people say in the Duty Free and things that are, are mentioned on her travel. But she starts off shopping for a holiday. And it seems fairly benign at the beginning, unless you know the ending already, in which case there are several notes that are loaded with meaning. Where she's going to shop for clothes for her holiday, handing in her notice at work, you know, things that people might do when they're on holiday, going on holiday. People making time to tell her how under stress she's been and how much she needs yes. a holiday. Where she's been told that god you're under so much pressure all the time how can you cope you've never had a holiday before why don't you go on a holiday and yeah so she books her holiday 
She goes to the department stores and does all of her shopping, through which she acts very strangely, involving walking out of some of the shops laughing maniacally about some suggestions by some shop attendants, which, as a first-time reader, you're confused by. Yeah. As a second-time reader, knowing her real motivations, you're like, that's why she thinks that's ridiculous. So then she gets on the plane, and then... She gets on a plane. Um, she is talking about waiting for a certain type of man. And one of whom she spots on the plane. One of whom she spots immediately, but that she ends up sitting next to another one. Yes. Uh, the other one goes on about macrobiotic diets. Is it macrobiotic diets? I think it's macrobiotic. Where he's, yeah. he's, he's talking about his... Eating lots his, of wild rice, goat's cheese... His and conditions. Having, having two orgasms a day, and everything is yin and yang. Yes. Um, but she is drawn to a frightened, sickly-looking man... Yes. ...who um, kind of seems to blanch when he sees her. Somebody who's probably not, yeah, not used to being approached by women. Yeah. This is not sounding like what you'd traditionally call a plot yet, but... As we said, uh, once we know we're heading towards someone who's trying to get themselves murdered, instead of looking for what the person, what Bill, the macrobiotic guy, assumes she's looking for, yeah, which is her type of man, as, as in um, someone for a fling, she's actually looking for the right type of person to um, knock her off. Which is somebody she can probably manipulate and influence rather than yeah. being somebody who's mentally or physically stronger than her and this is a fascinating part of the book that i want to talk about in depth but i'm going to pass over it in terms in a plotty sense yeah now so then she she arrives yeah. in whatever southern country she's traveled to and she travels to her hotel once she's had a further interaction with the two men one of whom wants her to come with him and one of whom wants to be completely left alone and then she arrives at the hotel and she she interacts with a an elderly American tourist. Mrs. Feekler? That's right. Feekler? Feekler. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's yeah. that's those are all the right letters in the right yeah, order. F I E K L E. Who is yeah. there to visit her son? Yeah. Her son. Who hasn't arrived yet. Who hasn't arrived yet. And another point we'll get back to. And so she seems to be sort of confused. Confused in a tourist Lisa, sense. Lisa, the main character? No, the, the older lady. Because Lisa does too. They, they, not Lisa. Lise. Lise. Um, Lise does too. She uh, has a very non-consecutive conversation with Mrs. Well, Spiegler. they have conversations at odds. Mm. It's like they're conducting their own conversations in spite of each they're other. Inter interest, interested in two completely different things. Yeah, where Miss Fiekler wants to go shopping. Yeah. And Lise wants to know more about her son. Yeah. And, and also wants to be murdered. And also wants to be murdered. <laughs> and to be honest, it's very frank about that, really. Yes, when Once you've read it, honest to God, time, the second she, she's crying out to everyone around her, like, "I just need to get killed, please." The second time through, when you when you when you finish it the first time, the last thing you want to do is pick it up and read it again. You just, for me, I wanted to put. I liked it, but I wanted to put as much distance between me and that book as physically possible. It's bleak. It's bleak. Strap in, listeners, because when we get to the end of this. I don't think we're going to come out laughing. There's a there's a kidnapping and a gas attack still to come. Yeah. But there's... So she goes on this anxiety-inducing shopping trip with Miss Fiekler. Yeah. In which... I, it's, it, it's almost... I almost cringe thinking about it. Because it's... These are two people who don't want to be spending time with each other, but they found themselves in each other's company. And Miss Fiekler wants souvenirs and bags and things. Tat. Yes. And... Lee's wants to know more about her son yeah. and it oh, it escalates in this shopping centre and I'll pass it over to you to continue the story of the shopping centre and they sort of lose track of each other mm. and Lise ends up going back to her hotel room she does a lot of um, faffing frankly. does a lot of faffing we'll talk about faffing as well because mm -hmm. I think there's, there's some very key moments of faffing um, and then she ends up on a, on a series of hijinks abroad she ends up Un unrelated consecutive adventures let me i'm going to try and get the right one in uh, right one first she ends up um almost trampled in a stampede and being tear gassed yeah so the 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 police tear gas a group of student protesters which causes them to run away from the tear gas and she's driven into a, a garage yeah and she gets picked up by um 
either the garage owner or a mechanic. It's a mechanic, yeah. Um, and it seems like Lisa's found her guy for a yes. second. Um, to him, it seems like she wants to get with him, even though he's married. To us, the reader, by this point, we're pretty convinced that it's the guy, as in the guy she's going to get to kill her. Um, and so she gets in the car with him and just drives out of the city. Yeah. And then, and I don't want to talk about this too much because I'd like to go into in, into it in detail because it's a really interesting uh, moment. That doesn't pan out. And she ends up fleeing, but then sort of fleeing back, stealing the car from him, driving off, ending up at the hotel where Bill from the plane, the macrobiotic Yin Yang he guy returns. is at. A shake passes through without ever really being met, but being referenced. Mostly his entourage arrives. Yeah, we'll talk about him later. You don't need to focus on him just yet. Yeah. Lise goes back to her hotel room for a while, then meets Bill and uh, goes out with him. He's thinking of one thing, she's thinking of another. Um, she kind of wants to get rid of him. She oh no sorry I, I said go back to the hotel at the wrong point she now goes back to the, the hotel. hotel when she's fled Bill fled Bill and who should be there but but the sickly man from the plane who turns, turns out to, to be, be <laughs> Miss Feekler's son uh, nephew nephew ne Richard. nephew Rich was it Richard I think it's yeah. nephew I think it's nephew yeah Richard uh, she pretty much manhandles Richard out of his hotel where he's just arrived round the side of a of, of, a, of a closed cafe. Drives him out to the park. Yeah. Says, I know what you are. You've been to uh, a mental asylum. You hurt women. You're going to hurt me. And then he does. And then he does. And then the book ends. With sort of a, a meta. Because sort of a... what what we've not talked about is the narrator of the book. Well, let's get into that when we stop talking about plot. But well, yeah, well, the, the, the plot being that this is the, the culmination of everything that's been hinted yep. throughout the book, and Lee's is murdered. And that is the plot. And that's the plot. That's how the book ends. Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go a little bit deeper. Throughout the book, there's a meta-narrative of two days later, or however long, is it two days? Was it? Um... The first time it's mentioned, there's an X number of days later, Lee's would be dead. Oh, well, hold that thought. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to that. Let's go right to the start of the book. Would you I'm like to do a dramatic reading? I'm going to do my dramatic reading. Oh, I'm hold excited. Hold on to your hats. And the material doesn't stain, the sales girl says. Doesn't stain. The customer, a young woman, is suddenly tearing at the fastener at the neck, pulling at the zip of the dress. She is saying, get this thing off me, off me at once. And so I did edit it a little bit out there, but that is how we begin the driver's seat. That is, that is the opening. I think the introduction, mm. I think of both the versions we have is the same introduction. John Lanchester. John Lanchester. Yeah. One of the sentences in that introduction is, has there ever been an author consistently good, as consistently good at opening sentences as Muriel Spark? Would you agree with that? Cause it's an interesting question because... He gives an example of one of the comforters, which is also great, which I, I might actually read now because I really, Go really it. enjoy it. Got it here. It's only fair for you to get a dramatic opening reading as well. It is. Can't let you one-up me on this one. On the first day of his holiday, Lawrence Manders woke to hear his grandmother's voice below. I'll have a large whole meal. I've got my grandson stopping for a week who's on the BBC. That's my daughter's boy, Lady Manders. He won't eat white bread. One of his fads. Lawrence shouted from the window, Grandmother, I adore white bread and I have no fads. Good opening line. It's a really good opening line. I think John Lanchester's point is that you're left with so many questions mm. that you want to keep reading. So on that on that note then, why does she want a dress that will stain? Mm. To what extent is she choreographing her own murder and how lurid, to use a book that crops up in the word... Oh, I love the word lurid. Quite a lot. Um, how lurid does she want her own murder scene to be? Well, she wants... Is that what it's about, do you think? I think... Lurid. If you were to say the word lurid to me, I'd associate it with pulpy detective novels. Which this is, to an extent. Yeah, and I think that a lurid death scene from a pulpy detective novel yeah. would have a body covered in blood. Yeah. Stained on the cobbles, you know. So does Lise want that for herself? I think so. I think Lise wants as dramatic and as 
romanticized a murder scene mm. as possible. What we might call um, gratuitous. Gratuitous. She wants a gratuitous death scene for herself. I think so, and I think that. She, well, there's um, she picks up a crime novel. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. So she is drawn to uh, clothes that don't go well together. She wants. Uh, she meets someone who's from Johannesburg who is looking for books that will suit her three spare rooms by colour scheme. Oh, I love and that. And whenever you come across that in a kind I of love that. writer's book, you assume the smackdown is coming from someone who wants books as... Ornaments. Ornaments. Well, I think the idea for that one is, as somebody who has interacted with somebody who has come in and they're like, mm. I want books that look this way. I want this edition. I want this colour to go with the other ones I have of this edition and this colour. Yeah. It is. It's hard to bite your tongue on that one. It is. It, it is a provocation. But least least joins right in. She joins right in, and she, she gives a recommendation. She gives a recommendation, and she picks one for herself with uh, green lettering, a white background, and um, the author's name is written in blue lightning bolts. Which is fantastic. I want that book. Fantastically garish. But she she seems to want to join in this. It would be a bit easy to call it a kind of um, feckless consumerism. I don't think that's the right word because I think there's a whole a whole sphere of books and book selling that I have no experience of, which exists solely in airports. Yeah, there are export and import editions of books that you can only buy in airports. But there is a attraction for lease beyond the airport books. That what she wants to eat on the plane, she what? she does not want to choose things that would be better for her, and I don't just mean the food that the bill recommends i also think she, that she seems to want to kind of sink into that kind of stuff i also think that control is an important aspect oh yeah she wants to make her own decisions about how all of this is going to go okay. right up till the end well uh, i mean again I, i've got stuff on this Oof. but sure i think i can control is going to be a key word in um a, a book called the driver's seat yes i mean the, the title is one of the most intriguing part well we, we can touch on that briefly now where so you read the title and you read the driver's seat and the only time a character's in a car in this book is when she's being driven somewhere and then she drives herself back which i think is interesting they're in a taxi at one point yes and she refers to uh or perhaps invents a useless dead husband who died in a motor accident and yes. was quote a, not a good driver yeah so that there are they, they these pop up a lot well the reference of you know what is a driver a driver of a life somebody who makes the decisions yeah um we haven't actually said directly i don't think that it, it i mean it turns out towards the end of the novel that not only does she want to get herself killed but she's also mentally ill herself yes and she latches onto Richard, someone who has been recently released from a, an asylum. Uh, an yeah. asylum. Um, so, I mean, one element of like who's the driver mm -hmm. could be um, her or her illness or madness. I mean, it's it's vague. And it's vague. I, um, but there's 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 purpose here. Parlance, I, I I feel queasy about saying making illness and madness sound like the same thing, but. Um, in the same way that the country is as vague as a Mediterranean country, her illness is as vague as... I mean, the first time I read it, I thought, oh, she's lost her mind. Oh, no, but remember, like... Think, oh, no, she's got... But I think psychology as a an area, even by somewhere as late as the 60s and the 70s, was still pretty rough around the edges compared to what we know now. Sure, but I think it's also legitimate to have a character who has gone crazy it is but i think that beyond going crazy you know go back another 30 or 40 years before this and people are still talking about hysteria yeah. you know we're still in a time where madness and mental illness are you know there's a confluence there there's a comparison mm. i think that somebody who's writing with the same words and vocabulary as muriel spark mental illness and madness could be considered one and the same yeah it's just a more basic understanding of what it means to be mentally ill. Yeah. I wonder if now she'd write it the same way, though. 
because I feel I like don't think so. I think specific mental illness isn't really the point. I think the language has evolved to the point where you could explain mental illness. I think back then people aren't used wants, to characters with mental illness. Do you think she wants to explain that part? Or do you no, I don't think, think it's important. I, I don't think that's as important to the plot. Because a mad character is really a device in fiction to say something else. Well, a mad character leads then on to the concept of an unreliable narrator. But she isn't the narrator. That's the thing. Yeah. There is a narrator in this book. Yeah. There is a meta narrative of a, an unnamed figure who is telling the story of Lise from outside her own experience. Which is another possible driver, but we'll get to that yeah. in a bit. Um, I wanted to say that quite early on, we get a line which sounds like um, classic crime in that um, I think it's chapter three opens with she'll be found tomorrow morning dead. Um, stabbed with a man's necktie around her neck etc et that's another thing to talk about yeah oh the necktie, the necktie. Or? okay choosing we'll the necktie yeah um that is sort of like a classic crime gimmick in a way oh no well the, num the number of those have you seen those editions of classic crime hardbacks that have been sort of painted in a particular hard-boiled style oh yeah and you'll the see chandler the, ones I have. the chandler ones and you'll see the sort of it'll be a you know, f as a cliche example, uh, a street street light being used as a spotlight over the the body of a woman in a white dress with a pearl necklace and a man's necktie around her throat. And a bottle of whiskey at her feet. You know, it's one of those things that it's it it has become cliche in both the cover and the content of a book. But that sort of that's a device mm -hmm. to say um, she'll be dead, so pay attention. Yeah. Uh, because in a in many ways. What happens in a in the driver's seat up until the murder is a series of very kind of banal happenings. That's that's the first hook. Yeah. Well, the first real hook is the opening sentence where you want to be like, why is she so offended by this new material? And then the second hook is the introduction of a meta narrative where somebody says that the character you've been following up to this point is going to die, mm. and you're, it's like it's like you're on a roller coaster. She is going to die you're going to get to that point B, but you're at point A and you've got to go on that path to find out what Why? happens between here and then. Yeah. Which is an interesting way of doing a, a narrative where you spoil the ending and you say, this is what's going to happen. Well, and that's, that's, that's the why done it. It's a way of writing it two ways. You're writing for the first time reader and the second. Yes. That is a sentence that is intended for the first time reader. Yes. Because the first time reader who knew nothing about the driver's seat probably would lose interest. Yes. The second time reader comes up to that sentence and go, oh, I wish that wasn't in there because it's, it's sort of more enjoyable to enjoy it all, all again. Um, but even then, that sentence is... In my head, that is potentially the start of the book. Mm. That's where the plot really starts. The book could easily have been introduced by a meta-narrative telling you the ending. There didn't need to be two chapters coming up to it. If you see what I mean. Uh, yeah. Like that would, in a... Let's say this was a pulpy crime fiction. That could have been the first sentence. Yeah. Do you think, final point on the um, staining thing, um, do you think that she uh, wants that um, aspect of theatre in her own death? Do, and also, as a second point, does she consistently want to be murdered throughout has she 100% decided on this, or has she, is she winging it? Um, little of column A and a little of column B. I think that the way she acts, she knows she isn't coming back. Mm. I think she knows what the end result is going to be, but I think the the unknown is whether she's going to be able to find somebody to do it. Yeah. Where she's going to, is she going to find that willing other party? I think easily, I think in her own head, it could have been she kills herself on this trip. Either way, she isn't coming back. Yeah. So second question then is why, mm. why does Lise want to die? That is the question of, of hangs over the whole book. Yeah. Why does she want this? There's the sort of, you know, framing things said by characters at the beginning of the book saying oh you've had such a tough time recently you're so stressed mm. could it be as simple could it be as this but one of the options is could it be as simple as she's had some kind of psychotic break 
the stress mm-hmm. has pushed her over the edge and she wants to die in a creative way. There is a reference later in the book to there being a coup in a different country yes. and someone says quite casually that oh, my shares went down after that coup. I had a psychotic breakdown or yeah. something like that. Um, so, th- I mean, contenders for why she wants to die, that we have this sort of... Th- I don't think it's this, but I think we should mention it because it does recur. True. This kind of um, focus on the trashiness of consumer products, the books, the meals, the clothes, the, clothes. Um, the souvenir tat in the, the department store, tat, all of that kind of stuff. But that doesn't um, that doesn't really sell it, does it? That doesn't really. Uh... Well, then that if you were taking the argument, you would have to argue that Lee's was representative of something greater than a single person, like a like a death of a society or something, you know. Yeah, that, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't does hang it? together, no. no. I wanted to um, just mention, before we get into uh, too far after arriving in the um, the foreign country, the Mediterranean country, there's a quote really early on in the book um, that I think is worth reading out because it uh, crops up quite a lot Ooh, later. Another reading. Another reading. Uh, it's not very long. I, I have no idea how we stand rights wise on reading up loads of Muriel. I think as long as I think so, as long as we aren't replacing the point of an audio book, I think we're fine. Okay, cool. Her lips, when she does not speak or eat, are normally pressed together like the ruled line of a balance sheet, marked straight with her old-fashioned lipstick, a final and a judging mouth, a precision instrument, a detail warden of a mouth. So it's already describing her as being serious of face. Mm-hmm. Of being unemotional, maybe, or at least reserved emotionally. Uh, unemotional, definitely want to come back to because that's a really important. Is is that repression? Is that her repressing her emotions? Yeah, or is it a kind of because in many ways she acts like the opposite of repressed? Because she is, I think, in terms of when she's shown to be shopping for her clothes, she's shopping for stuff that's outside of the norm of what she normally wears. Yeah lurid colors bright colors yeah it seems like she's almost at the beginning it's almost positive in the sense that she seems to be reinventing herself in a more positive way yeah but then it takes a darker edge there's definitely details of her appearance that are used as kind of tags to keep referring to uh-huh. L- um shortly after her lips are described like that they are described she's regarding some of her um juniors at her work mm-hmm. and her lips are straight as a line that would cancel them out completely and that, that kind of sentence stands out in a book written with quite simple language. Like I this. think that when you when you use metaphors relating to the mouth, it's often about what is said and what's not said. Mm-hmm. So if she if her mouth is described like that, is she a character who would say something like that, or would want to say something like that? Yeah, and also it kind of the cancel them out completely reminded me of. Um, someone who is destroying their um, external life. A bit like, you know, m- modern day ghosting or blocking people. Oh. It has that kind of ring to it. Like someone who is mean. determined to um, wreak complete destruction on their... There's a finality to it. Yeah, yeah, that she's, that she's already um, convinced of this. Um, and then the fact that uh, her lips are described as a detail warden is interesting because Mm -hmm. um we are drawn to her lips again and again when she's running around during the stampede uh she's often open mouthed it's less um sort of she seems less considered she seems slightly more confused as a when she's dead set on the fact that you know she's found richard and she's driving him out to the park sure they're back to straight if i was if I was a cinematographer for a version of this film, you told me earlier that there was a version of this film. I had no idea it had ever been adapted. Yeah, there's an Elizabeth... T- Elizabeth Taylor keeps cropping up as our sort of star of movie versions. That's she's really in interesting. She's in The Taming of the Shrew and she's in The Driver's Seat, which you can uh, watch on YouTube. I'm not sure if that's piracy or not, but... Um, if it's there, it's there. It's there. But I think if, if, if I was... holds a goal. <laughs> that's awful. <laughs> if I was to... If I was to choreograph the shots of this film, one, I'd make this film a short film. Mm -hmm. And if I was to create imagery for this film, I would shoot her 
from the eyes down. I would never show this character's eyes. Oh, that's really interesting. Every shot of her would be centered around the lower nose and lips. Well, you're talking like you are a cinematographer. Because I love, I think when I when I read a book, because I've got such a fondness for films, I'm already doing the imagery in my head. Mm. I would imagine how I would be watching it. And in this one, I think that her eyes are almost never talked about, if ever. There's a dispute over what colour they are. But then again, that's still a kind of that's confusion. Very vague. Very yeah. vague. I and get the impression, because I don't think like that when I read, but I certainly get the impression that everyone who meets Lise doesn't get a good reading on her. And I think that if I was casting this film, I'd look for somebody who had a very striking lower half of their face. Mm. And then film I certainly don't think she's got suicidal written in her eyes whenever she's walking around. Well, I think that whoever's designed the covers for these two books has thought exactly the same. Yeah. Because no version of this book I've ever seen has a woman's face on it. Yeah, that's true. So I think that it's her her lips and her body mm. are what's important in the imagery in this book. Yeah. Last point about her lips then. Yeah. Her lipstick is described as as being old fashioned. Okay. I get a strong sense throughout the book and I'll bring up my quotes as I get to them but um, that she's meant to be 29 between 29 and 36 okay it's 1970 we assume ambiguously early middle aged yeah um, the old fashioned lipstick makes me think that she's maybe a little bit too old for the sexual revolution that she's maybe missed the boat okay. there seems to be an over reliance on her part throughout the book to find um either because she wants to die or because um, just her sexual taste mm -hmm. that she wants a more old-fashioned man I don't know which order that happens in has she gone mad because she thought I th thinks I don't fit in this world anymore because I want some old-fashioned version of uh, a man well, and I'm surrounded by people who talk about yin and yang I was about to say rice. Bill Bill is an example of at that time what new man would be somebody who's less indulged masculine. less masculine and indulged and researched in alternative practices and beliefs yeah someone who has been exposed to the wider world and gone out and explored it and taken things that interest them from that at the cost of being in, at least in lisa's eyes if i'm classically right, classically masculine classically masculine and there are a few points in the book where she is excited by a glimmer of um brutality from men mm -hmm. when one of them starts talking about the fact that he uh, shoots animals for a living she gets interested in him as soon as he says um oh but it really uh it, it gets really annoying because i had to aim past someone i obviously don't want to shoot anyone she loses interest completely <laughs> when but, she's insulted yeah. and um derided by men in a rather typical misogynist fashion mm -hmm. she's described as being consoled and then she but is, 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 is of innocence for them but is is that because she's looking for somebody to kill her well that's what i mean like which way round are those things is she mm. does she have an illness or a madness and so she wants someone to kill her or because of this um old-fashioned dependency let's call it she decided i might as well get killed well let's i think possibly the let, let's look at so if we're put placing importance on the sexual revolution, the generation that came immediately before the sexual revolution is potentially one of the most sexually repressed generations there's ever been. Right. Post-war, late 40s, 1950s, there was a revolution in morality in terms of a rewriting of what it meant to be a man a woman in a relationship living in a moral society a moral society meaning you know the morals of i guess it's one of those things where after a major war the winner gets to rewrite morals as well as history what mm. is right and what is wrong and i think that sort of style of masculine feminine dominant submissiveness is present in that generation and then suddenly it's all turned on its head in the 1960s yeah and what about the women who are left behind who were banking on 
uh, slightly more either through upbringing or um, preference banking on a more traditional yeah and whether or not that is the impetus for the motivations of the character in this book we don't know but it is a possibility it's a possibility i'm hesitant to bring direct autobiography into this but muriel spark was a catholic Uh quite a serious catholic yeah uh right up until she died with a i think of you know reasonably um certainly something that she uh goes to in in her other novels yes definitely. perhaps this is uh without ever mentioning catholicism or well, something, i have i have i have heard muriel spark Puritanism. i've heard muriel spark described as a catholic writer yeah where i think her religion is not insignificant in the majority of her work yeah and so i think that it is prudent to assume that there may might be some importance placed on religion in this one as well even though it's it's definitely one of her more experimental novels, mm. it may be it's a departure from her normal normal I say, her other writing styles. It's a can of worms this whole um, theory, but the second read through, um, I did get that sort of impression. On my first sort of naive read through, where I was still surprised. <laughs> You're going to say on my first naive read through, I came to those conclusions. <laughs> On well, my no. second enlightened one. <laughs> <laughs> I understood it completely. I understood you're a twat. <laughs> I think my first reading where I, w- I was surprised, I, I didn't pick up on the hints that she was wanting to be murdered until very late on in the oh, book. Oh, okay. I think I was slow on the uptake on that one. I I don't really know what she was doing until it was spelled out to me. Mm. But my conclusions at the end of that were that it was almost a response to generations and generations of pulp in terms of standard structured fiction in terms of somebody dies at the end of a story a lot of these pulpy books somebody dies at the beginning of the story and that's the spark that ignites the rest of the book in a way she does yeah well she's dead by the opening of chapter three exactly like 20 pages in which is not quite uh, turning on its head of the standard trope, but a, a rewriting. Yeah. You know, the end is placed in the middle. Mm-hmm. The beginning isn't the beginning. The end isn't the end. Mm. And I think that if it's referring to how pulp and crime fiction could be written, if we're talking about the difference between a why done it and a who done it, being told a who done it is it's Poirot. It's Poirot standing in a room and pointing the finger. That's a who done it. And who done it is whoever Poirot pointed at. He's never wrong. Mm. It's a why done it. It's you know enough of the facts. You know what Praro knows by the end of the Praro book at the beginning. You know what, yeah, yeah. What does you about to ask me what Praro knows? I was about to say exactly what you just said. (laughs) But it's one of those things where is this an exploration of these dynamics or is this just an exploration of changing a narrative structure? Mm. Is the character as important as that or is it just Muriel Spark's attempt at rewriting? at this point classic structure could it be both i think it is i wanted to say um and i don't mean this to sound negative because i'm going to um talk about reasons why i would say there is a certain amount of bad writing in this book oh god let me just read you a quote the woman comes to the street door emitting noise like a brown container of laughing gas until the taxi is out of her scope now What's the bad writing there? You tell me. Do you not think there is any? Read me it again. The woman comes to the street door, emitting noise like a brown container of laughing gas until the taxi is out of her scope. I'm not a trained writer, but I've read a lot. And it's it's clunky, but I couldn't tell you why. There is a... I mean, we've already established this woman is laughing. In fact, there's quite a good line about her laughing the ancestral laughter of the streets or something yeah, like that. Yeah, well, beforehand. she's she laughs... Uh-huh. A lot. Yeah, yeah. And often at very inappropriate times. Yeah. Uh, no, th- 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 this isn't least. This is someone she meets on yeah, her way yeah. to the airport. But, um, you know, Wait, so is, this sorry, sounds really, really pedantic. B- but b- before we go on, though, yeah. is that reference to the laughing gas before the gas attack? Yeah. That's interesting. But okay. we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, she, it would be fairly crap anyway if you said she laughs like, um, the sound of a laugh. Okay. It would be like saying, you know, she farts like the sound of a whoopee cushion when you sit on it. 
Okay. It's not really stretching the imagination that far. But also, it's she la- she makes the noise of a, con- a container of laughing gas, which doesn't actually... Well, to me, that's like a... Noise. I think a container of laughing gas, it goes off like a grenade. No, I think you inhale it and then you start laughing. It but I think it the, make it's, it's a, a container noise. not... I imagine the way I hear that is pressurized, high-pitched, sort of irregular, maybe. Those yeah. are the images that come into my head when that's said. Yeah, and it, it it sort of scans first time round. When you think about it, it's not very good. I don't think it is very good. I just want to say there are a few things that really, really stand out, and the reason they stand out is because this is quite a it's quite a simply written novel. There's quite a lot of admin. There's lots and lots of scenes where she, you know, she goes in through the door, she sits down at her seat, she opens a handbag, she takes out her purse. Well, how she how takes how much mu- how much of that is in reference to it being a meta narrative? It's somebody observing her do these things. I, I I read it my second time through, like it was somebody reading police report notes of what well, she yeah, did. Yeah, um, and it's interesting because it just it has that voyeuristic feel. And it also has a very clerical yeah. admin style to it. But whilst you're reading it, it's hundred pages long. There's quite a lot of those sorts of pages. You know, she sits down, she opens a purse, she goes to the cupboard, she puts the money in the cupboard, she goes and sits down again, then she stands up. And then something happens, and when you have quite a lot of that, it the 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 moments that that reach towards imagery, really really stand out. And so okay. it's interesting that almost the first simile we come across, that laughing gas one, is kind of odd. Hmm. Then later in the novel, we have all this tear gas flying around, and uh-huh. and Lise is crying because tear gas. Tear is gas, hit. yeah. And again, it's a hundred page novel. It's, it's only made up of so many words. You well, know? there's. I think in a book this short, there are no coincidences. Exactly. Yeah. So it makes me think that that's a strange simile, and perhaps deliberately hmm. strange to make us remember that whoever's writing this, either on behalf of the main character or because perhaps it's narrated by a someone who understands the main character through and through more than a police report. E- either way, is suggesting that they don't know how to feel emotional without some kind of chemical stimulant either way the main character's dead at the point of telling sure yeah which is so you're being told this story by somebody who is left behind whatever that might mean yeah so it's always going to be removed there's another there's another one later on um there's this um paragraph which i really like but again in the same way as before because it's a quite a um S- simple sounds like an insult. I, it's clearly not an insult. I, I, I think writing simply is as hard, if not harder, than writing. There's a crossover complexity. there. When you see like it on the front of book covers, there is a bit of a crossover between like b- beautifully simple. There is a bit of a crossover between beautifully simple writing and beautifully simple author. Well, it's it's the it's the difference between sort of elegance and simplicity. You yeah, know. there are a few simple authors that slip through the cracks and get the kudos that. Um, educatedly simplistic writing See, one of, should get. One of my favourite authors being Murakami. He right. he treads that line between being simple and boring. Mm. Where is he writing in his own style or is he just telling you things you don't need to know? Anyway, I'm detracting from your upcoming dramatic reading. <laughs> Sorry. This is, no, this isn't a dramatic reading. I want to get through, through this uh, fast. But um, she is walking through the city. We don't know where it is. And she's looking around at the um, thronging crowds. Um, Thronging. The traffic crossings, the busy residents, the ambling tourists and the worried tourists. And such of the unencumbered youth who swing and thread through the crowds like antelopes whose heads, invisibly antlered, are airborne high to sniff the prevailing winds and who so appear to own the terrain beneath their feet that they never look at it. That sentence is so unlike any other sentence in the book. That's what I mean. Like, the the swinging and threading through the crowds, the invisibly antlered, I really like well, but, all of that but, but, of but it's like suddenly, suddenly the... Different you know, writer. Well, but it's like similarly you're being transported to the savannah. Yeah. And the people are animals. And yeah. they're acting like animals. I think my, the most evocative thing in that line is really simple, but it gets me, is the relaxed tourists... And the anxious tourists. Yeah. Because yeah. you know exactly what is meant by that. You yeah. see them on the street. You see the tourists who are lost. I, 
think the like they own it, they they don't need to look at the ground because they own it thing is really telling. And it yeah. like, comes into her actual death, I think, mm-hmm. because she's kind of always focused on the ground. But again, on these these bits that stand out that actually don't quite work, a bit like the she laughed like a container of laughing gas, which doesn't laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, for one thing, re- super pedantic. I don't think the plural of antelope is antelopes. I think it's antelope. It's just antelope, yeah. Yeah, but also um, antelope do look at the ground a lot because they eat grass. That's true, but they also look up and about because they might be lions. Because they might be lying. Now, it really, really stands out again. And first time reading, you might think, oh, that, that's kind of odd. But later, she sees a wildlife documentary and there's a, yeah. a, a rambunctious stampede of wildebeest. There are no coincidences in this book, I feel. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's the kind of thing, first time round, I'd have thought, well, that was a kind of weird sentence. Um, and maybe if I was being really cynical, I'd think like, oh, she tried something there and it didn't work. What I think then the common thread there is that people are animals. The s- or that she is over aware of whether or not people know, have have any kind of deliberation over their own lives. She sees those young people and thinks, they're in control, and maybe she's thinking, "I'm in control. I'm going to get myself killed. That's what I'm. That's my purpose." That's interesting because I I looked at it a different way. Okay. I looked at it as, I think when if in a book, especially a book this short, you refer to people as animals once, and then you talk about a wildlife documentary, the common thread there is that animals are people, and people are animals. Yeah. It can go both ways. Are the you know, and what that brings into it is people act on instinct. And are animals more intelligent than we give them credit for? Mm. That similarly goes both ways. I think there's a, a detailed thing about the herd thing. and herd, herd, herd suggests following blindly. It suggests yeah. groupthink. It suggests a lot of things. But the first time we see a herd animal, antelopes, mm-hmm. um, they are in control and deliberate and the second time they're in chaos mm. and shortly after that Gas there attack. is a real stampede and well, the then, word stampede is used in that bit well then i think that is definitely the tie-in yeah where people are acting on instinct like animals and when but, it, well, but as, as, as soon as they're out of control they stampede yeah you know? but i don't think it's control a, well, we're, we're back to control then yeah, if we're we talking are. about control where people as a group aren't in control, but Lee's on her own, knowing exactly what she wants, yeah. is in control. Well, that's the thing. I don't think it's about people in general. I think it, I think the antelope and wildebeest reflects where Lee is. Or does that reflect how she thinks about other people? Because she clearly really think thinks... She does I think, think she th- about other people that She much. thinks less of other people than she thinks of herself. That's clear. Yeah, I think when she sees people as antelope or antelopes, she is thinking, I know where I'm going. I'm that sort of person who has uh, I mean she has far from what those young people walking around the city for the first time think mm-hmm. she's thinking I know what I'm going to do I'm going to get myself killed um, good for me and then when the wildebeest imagery comes along it reflects that she is much less concentrated much less certain well, the second that stampede hits she lost. loses yeah. all the control and she stumbles into the next part of the story literally she sort of falls into this garage yeah and do you think she loses control not only because she ends up in a li- literally in a stampede, but because she has second thoughts about whether or not she wants to get killed. It's one of those things where, getting a little off topic for a second, people who commit suicide in a way, or attempt to commit suicide by jumping off a bridge, and they jump and they survive, a lot of them come back with the story that as soon as they jump, they regret it. Which is kind of horrendous. I'm thinking of that Golden Gate Bridge documentary. Have you seen I'm, that? Th- I'm thinking of the same thing. Yeah. Where the ones who survive wish they didn't jump. Yeah. And that's one of those things where the second you actually you've actually imperiled your life. Yeah. You're going. The natural reaction is to regret it. Yeah. And I think that the second she's in some kind of mortal danger, like being in that stampede, suddenly it comes back into focus, even just for a second. That's a really good point. Where yeah. she has a second thought about what she's doing. But then Cause the she's a meet- she has that proximity to physical threat. But then the second time after that stampede, she's immediately put into contact with somebody who fits the bill for what she was looking for in a man anyway. Yeah. So it sort of drags her back into the way she was thinking before. And a few red herrings to ease her in. Yeah. But I think that bit directly during and just after the stampede 
could be read as a questioning of by her yeah. of what she's doing. Yeah. No, I think I think you're probably onto something now. Um, there is a. Uh, I'm not going to read it out because it is a long series of what I just said about handbags sitting, standing, walking. But it's followed by a r- another really, really standout bit, not because it's a expansive um, simile or anything, but a, s- a, a whole chunk of that ends, and it just says, who knows her thoughts? Who can tell? And that seems like a really um, teasing sort of what the, What that reads to me is that that changes the personality of the meta-narrative. Yeah. That makes me think more journalist or biographer somebody who's writing this from an emotional perspective rather than a administrative this is shortly after she i mean after her first uh, buying address and it being implied to us through what the sales girl says that the dress is hideous oh. or the, ch- the combo is hideous yeah um it's never said directly uh, and then a few pages later and before this bit about um who knows her thoughts who can tell um the narrator makes the narrator makes some comment or it's just simply said that she you know she walked wrong with her lurid outfit uh-huh. and that is the first sense you have of that the narrator isn't on side with least well the narrator has their own thoughts yeah which is really interesting with this book because as you, you've already said about like police police report that kind of thing so let's it seems to go a bit deeper than a police report but it's almost like a a Sp- a spiritual police report. Well, we've already, we've talked about in previous podcasts about Nabokov and about Nabokov being as a, you know, a slave driver and his galley slaves, they tremble as he walks past. Yes. Is the narrator Muriel Spark talking about her character? Who can know this character's thoughts? It's a really good question because I think it's it's really easy for us to pick up a book with her name on it and assume that but it's, but it's one of those things we haven't talked about yet well we've because writers come up with voices all the time they don't yeah. have to name their narrator well then they don't have to name the narrator but is this narrator the writer whoever this might be i think i think it wouldn't it it wouldn't be unhelpful to refer to the narrator as the writer but mm. whether or not that's actually muriel spark i think is Okay, well then maybe may, maybe giving the writer a name is unhelpful. A bit like Dil- um, a bit like under Milkwood, yes. having a first voice, uh-huh. a kind of character who's all seeing and all knowing, but also involved in the way that the real author Muriel Spark isn't. Yes. Okay. Well, then you that... get the f- sense that the narrator has the narrator has all the information. Walks past her in an airport, you know. Well, the, the narrator has all of the information apart from what was going on in her head. Exactly. The narrator knows everything she did, but not why she did it. Which raises the possibility that um, the question of who's in the driver's seat is a comment on writing itself yep. and whether or not you can really know anyone's motivation yeah. fully. But then we're also straight back to why done it again. Yeah, we are. Why? Why did she do it? And I don't think I don't think there's an answer to be found in the book. I don't think anywhere in the book there are the words that s- describe or explain why she did it. Yeah. I think everything that explains why she did it is found in the reader's own interpretation. And I think we've we've talked about several reasons why she could have done it, and each is as likely as the next, you know. Do you think that, um, I mean, are you, uh, I think you are, because I think we've talked about this before, but are you a David Lynch fan? Yes. Do you think that there is a certain Lynch, I know Lynchian is very overused, but do you think there's a Lynchian quality in this? Well, I think Lynch, Lynch sort of cribs from the same school that Muriel Spark was writing from in this. Yeah. Where it's this juggling and changing of a narrative. Like, it's probably unhelpful. I'm going to go on a massive tangent about Lost Highway for a second. That's fine. <laughs> Which is one of my favourite Lynch films, where, in brief, a char- it appears, in my opinion, to be the description of the creative process, where a character is workshopped and rewritten. The actor changes on a particular character, mm. and the name is changed during the film, but it appears to be the same character inhabiting the same space. A character who turns up who is the director, uh, area that is used to 
describe and explain the creative process there's a cabin mm. that is seen to be exploding and imploding like an idea forming and then being crystallized yeah the highway being the highway back to whatever place ideas live yeah. before they're called upon it's this idea that creativity and who who is in control of a story yeah is it the director is it an actor's interpretation and in a literary sense is it a writer or does the character evolve on its own mm -hmm. you know i think when you were talking about I think Lynch we could go as far as calling lease the actor here yes i think so and i think that when you talk about it as lynchian i don't think that i'd love to see david lynch's driver's seat yeah well, to be honest um I was meaning more in the sense that. Um, oh, sorry. I no, just no, no, that's a really, <laughs> big really ramble. Good point. Then. No, no, it's. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's that's a. I think that's a perfect way to think about it because I definitely think there is that kind of, um, who is in charge on kind of levels of creative control, in that way, um, but I meant, going back to this sort of simplicity of writing, the kind of, the weirdness, the um, spookiness of quite ordinary things i mean until the last scene quite ordinary things happening but it's it's sort of like uh we talked about laughter and and moments of seemingly unprovoked emotion uh -huh. in really banal settings like a shopping um center or, yeah. or that kind of thing that strikes me as very lynchian the kind of uh, the, the odd thing happening in the really banal place oh no well i think lynch to a t is you could probably describe him in a few words as sort of small town surrealism. Mm. Like Twin Peaks is a small town that has an enormous spiritual universe going on around it. Yeah. And I think in this same way, you've got, I've never been so unsettled by a character going shopping as I have the beginning of this book. Mm. You Although know. Immediate, as soon as you said that, I thought of Laura Palmer's mum in the third series of twin peaks going shopping <laughs> yeah. that was pretty unsettling as well but it's one of those things well then it is lynchian where yeah. something an action so ordinary can be turned on its head and made unsettling yeah and final point on that if i really like that idea and i i, I personally would put uh -huh. my money on it but um i suppose the last maybe not the last, but another option on who is the driver would be no one. Well, that's that, I think that's a good way to bring this to a close. Who is in the driver's seat? Who are the candidates of being in the driver's seat? There's Lise. Mm -hmm. Is she in control of her own destiny? There's Muriel. There's Muriel, who is the writer. There's Lise's killer. Lise's killer. There is the narrator. And there is Lise's mental illness. I think... Slash madness. In my own reading of it, I would say it was Lee's. Who is the driver? Who is the driver? In most situations, before I would have said the whole book, but now that we've talked about it, there are moments where she does lose control. Mm. But she seems to have an idea of what she wants, how she wants it to happen. And by the end of the book, she's achieved that. She has driven herself to that goal. And there is a part in the book where she does drive herself. She drives a car. Yeah, I would say I I I don't quite agree because I I would say, and this involves categorizing mental illness or madness as a as a separate. You think entity, she's being driven by her compulsions? Which is problematic, yeah. Yeah, I know, but it is literature. Remember, we don't have to be quite tied to the same. Well, no, but it's, I think I I don't think it is unreasonable to say that people people who suffer from particular conditions can be driven by their compulsions. I think there are a few moments of doubt in the book, and I think that's when we see flashes of Lise being rational, sane, if you want to call it that. And I think for the bulk of the novel, the driver in the driver's seat is Lise's uh, madness, which okay. manifests as a compulsion to get herself killed. And I think it serves as a uh, neat parallel for Muriel Spark to describe the relationship between author and character I, I think i like that interpretation a lot and i think that the way it's written simply i said before police report but now 
I would probably say psychiatrist. Oh. It's written in a very medical and very terse. You get, apart from the sort of strange tangents into simile, it's very measured and you get important information like she went here and did this. Yeah. This happened. It's written like somebody who wants to understand rather than know. Yeah. So I think I think I am actually on board with your idea that it is it is written it is a book written from the perspective of somebody trying to understand somebody else's compulsions. Yeah. Yeah. So we've established that obviously uh you know, she's trying to get herself killed. Yeah. We've questioned why. Um, the other thing I want to bring into it, and uh, there are no certain answers to anything we've said. We've, we've hypothesized, and there's no certain answers to this either. But one Nothing of the things I find all. most interesting is that she recognizes in Richard on the plane that he is capable of killing her. It's immediate. Yes. And she knows, she feels bereft when she loses sight of him. And she's consoled by the return. There is an there is a connection. And there is no hint whatsoever that he is murderous or is capable of doing anything violent. No. Well he as a character he reads like somebody reformed. Mm. Somebody who's been through a process. Somebody who is nervous of the temptation to go back. That's how he reads at the end. At yeah. the start of the novel, when he fir- when we first meet him. He just reads as a nervous man. He reads as a really nervous man on a plane. And then but his she sees something. And then his aunt is introduced mm. as a secondary character. And then his character is introduced through her descriptions of him. And then you only realise those descriptions can be applied to him when he's revealed to be the nephew. Because it's quite innocent stuff. It's 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 not it's it, it doesn't scream murderer, put it that way. But and he to be fair, he isn't a murderer. He attacks someone um He is he is made a murderer. He has murderous compulsions let's put it that way yeah and lee's turns him into a murderer at the end of the book yeah so in the run-up to the ending um i wanted to talk about the slightly comic comic aspect of um this whole premise of someone wanting to get themselves killed okay um there is a bit whilst um uh, lee's is on the plane and there's that kind of role reversal of how typically chauvinistic Bill seems okay. and how weedy Richard seems, which on second read is is, is uh, the wrong read, really. He is chauvinistic and he is a pig, oh. but he is actually the wimpy, macrobiotic yin-yang guy. And Richard, the weedy one who sort of blanches and runs away, is the one it's who one is capable of, doing capable something of stabbing someone to death. Um, and uh it's sort of really easy to read once you realize that what she is looking for i mean she repeatedly says she's not interested in sex yes to to new to multiple men what she's looking for is obviously death yes. it's like a classic eros thanatos thing mm-hmm. she wants the latter um and there's a really interesting give me sex or give me death uh well no don't give me sex <laughs> just give me death and there's a really interesting bit. A few pages later, I think it's Mrs. I keep forgetting her name. Fiekler, Feikler. 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 Um, she says something about, um, I never trust airlines from those countries where the pilots believe in the afterlife, which <laughs> sounds like a bit of stand-up. Like, I'm sure I've seen a stand-up routine along those sort of lines. Like, you never want to hear anyone say, um, you know, praise be to God when they're setting off. Someone, So someone who's in charge of your survival. Yeah believing that life that death isn't the end yeah, it's a bit yeah. like you know having a president who believes in armageddon having you know nuclear codes it's a similar kind of gag <laughs> um, but it seems doubly kind of or it, it seems it seems ironic when you realize that that's exactly what the driver of the novel is after which okay. is death as opposed to the driver of the plane um she is she's the one determined um to die Uh so that that kind of um that was another kind of subtle joke that i only picked on um second time around um there is um oh and there's there's slightly a a kind of on the nose uh, part i'm not sure if you picked up on this um i'm sure you have uh when she arrives the concierge at the hotel says you left part of yourself at home oh yeah 
quite on the nose, that. Yeah. That other part, he is still en route to our country, but he will catch up with you in a few hours' time. And that's interesting, because, again, when we're talking about this sort of uh, desperate for death yeah. sort of thing, if we take that as author uh, interference, death is actually already a part of her, uh -huh. according to that. That's pretty strong. That's not... But then that's... Uh, is death a part of everybody? Death is a part of everybody's lives. Mm. You know, it's it's always the full stop. So I think that that could be read as death always being a part of your life. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, and then there's also this recurring thing. You know, at the end when she notices in the cafe that the the, the chairs stack and it makes her really really sad. Uh -huh. And then earlier on, she um, we haven't actually talked about her name yet, but she's mm. she's renting a room somewhere where all the the, f the tables stack, I think, and the tenants all have long leases. Mm -hmm. um, Lease. And she has a kind of temporary one, I guess, or maybe she's bored of hers. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of kind of uh, this dark pine wood in her empty flat that she's added nothing yeah. to. Her flat is fashionable. I would say sparse. But it's, is it not described as being of a, of a new modern style? Like it's... Um, I'm not sure if it's new and modern, but she, she has added but it's, nothing it's, to it. But it's it, 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 it's it's like it's been interior designed and she's changed nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which maybe ties into the fact that she's a bit out of time and not... Yeah? I don't know, maybe not. Maybe I'm pushing it. Well, for me, that just reads like she's sort of living in a showroom. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there is this sense and... Maybe it's a whole other question. We don't need to get into it because we're running out of time. But whether or not her death is completely set in stone and predetermined, um, there's this recurring thing of darkness closing in on her. There's that little light that she as a, a mottled um, globe that um, there's a great quote about it, actually. Uh, it turns um, something like it turns off uh, as if having to put up with lots of clients without complaint. She was suddenly too much for it. I'm paraphrasing because I can't find my quote, but that's an interesting something one. like that. And then later, just before she dies, there is a um, a cat that disappears into the adjacent blackness, mm -hmm. um, and she does a lot of looking at the ground. At that point, it seems like the world is all the world is sort of closing in, and and the colours are bleeding out. Well, to be to be very blunt about it, I think her death is set in stone. Yeah, because you can read that book twenty times, and she always dies at the end. Well, yeah, exactly. So, you know, as a character... The writing is on the wall and in the book. As a creation, her her destiny is set. Yeah. Um, oh, just back to the uh, folding, the stacking seats. Oh, yeah. When she's back in... Um, I can't remember his name. Carlo? Carlos? I think it's Carlos. Carlos. The, the, uh, he seems to be a quite a good contender for killing her. Uh-huh. And then... Top um, three. And then hits on her. Mm. Which obviously is a big turn-off for Lise. Um, who wants nothing but death? Uh, and he's he makes he is briefly in the driver's seat, mm -hmm. ding ding ding. Um, but then he says uh, we can make out, and then um, these front seats roll back, and that's when she kind of uh, freaks out, which seems to tie into two sort of strains. One is the neutralizing of the actual driver's seat, and two the, this sort of this strange sense of her having a bit of a flat pack life, like all of this stacking furniture, and hmm. she seems to be living in a kind of Ikea nightmare in, in a way. Yeah, well, if we're talking about her being from some sort of nebulous Scandinavian country. Yeah, well, there we go. There we go. It Have all comes full circle. On the uh, nub in there. Um, so, uh, should we end with the death? Yeah, to end at the end. Let's end with the end then. Let's end with the actual death itself. So she's taken Richard yeah. out to the park and she analyzes him. She breaks him down piece by piece. Yeah. Which is too much for him. And he sounds semi rehabilitated. He sound he's he's resisting her temptation. And he says, um, uh, he's attacked someone but didn't kill her, but he uh, is clearly very uncomfortable with her. There's a, I'm still fascinated by that kind of two-way recognition. 
he recognizes her as someone who wants either to be he wants to kill or who or what he recognizes that she wants she to wants be killed him to be killed yeah and Sorry, that she wants to him, him him to kill her yeah and then she can recognize him as somebody who has the capacity mm. but either way whatever the recognition is it happened yeah he and says to her when yeah. she says um i'm not interested in sex he says, you're afraid of sex, he says, almost joyfully, as if sensing an opportunity to gain control. Back to that word. Control. I think this book is about control. Yeah. Who control over your own fate, control over others, what that means to you, whether that be a sexual control yeah. or a control over whether somebody lives or dies. Yeah, it I seems like he has a more limited sense of control. His 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 is re- his is reduced to sex, it, whereas hers has a much more kind of. Well, hers grander. is. It's so interesting because throughout the whole book, it's about her being in control, and then at the end, she has to give up control in order to be killed. Yeah, or she controls all of it. And either she enjoys relinquishing relinquishing it at the last minute, or she even controls that minute. Yeah. Because she makes it all happen. She does. She she convinces an unwilling murderer to go through with it. Wh- whether or not his impulses are dormant or not, she takes him there, gives him the knife, and literally points out where to do it. She is very she particular about where as, to be stabbed. She even goes as graphic, and I told you we were going to end on a really bleak note here um we must do a cheery wrap-up afterwards but she even says something like recognizing that it's about sex for him says you can have sex afterwards get me killed i think that's about as bleak as it can possibly get about as dark and bleak as as it happens as as it can Mm -hmm. get well so at the end of the book we're left with lee's getting what she wanted yeah and the police entering Richard's uh, place of work or dorms or whatever, wherever he is, with their um, uniforms that have that protect against um, pity and fear, fear and pity, or fear and pity, pity and fear. It's repeated. So they're indoctrinated against. Indoctrinated. Those they are. They're almost unimportant as to who they are. They are the arbiters at the end of the story. They yeah. turn up, and that's time to go. Yeah. You know, being exempt from pity and fear means you're, you know, you're not a character. You're back to a bureaucrat, which is how uh, Bill describes Richard. Yeah. Saying he's not your type. But it's oh, it's one of these things. By the end of the story, you're left with a whole, you're left with a trail of characters. Yeah. None of whom had any real resolution. Yeah. They came and they went and they were as unimportant to us as they were to Lee's. Yeah. We got little snippets of them and we got opinions of them through what somebody else assumes she thought of them. Yeah, yeah. Which is a really interesting separation of describing a character. Yeah. I want to leave you on a quote that I don't, I can't quite fathom. Oh. I'd love to hear your point of view oh, and anyone who's listening, if they've got a, um, a two take. cents. At one point, Lee says, a girl isn't made of cement. But everything is different now. It's all changed. Believe me. My immediate gut reaction to that is cement literally changes properties. It goes from being mm. wet to being hard. Yeah. It goes from being pliable to being solid until it crumbles. So I think that's a talk about how somebody can change. That's my opinion. Yeah. That's my immediate visceral reaction to that quote. Well, I'd love to hear any any and all opinions on that. It's something I'll be thinking about for the next yeah, you can, um, few. You can write in all all opinions to earreadthis nice at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Facebook, earreadthis. And Twitter under the same. Yep. And we will start doing things on Twitter. We will start we, doing things on have, Twitter. <laughs> we haven't yet. But um, thank you for listening to this first uh, episode on uh, a modern text. A modern text. We will text. be back uh, next time with a new uh, Foul Papers. Yeah. And we've got more exciting stuff to come. We're going to do a, um, a an anti-recommendation and we've got something special planned for 
right about Christmas. Yeah, we've got a nice, a nice cosy Christmas special. Nice cosy Christmas special. And uh, a deep and sincere thank you to anyone who's made it this far. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for thank you for listening to our strange and often unconnected opinions about a book that I really enjoyed actually. Yeah. More. But I hope you were listening from the passenger seat. <laughs> there is more content in this book than its size would belie. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.